Fly fishing is fun. It really is. It's quiet, peaceful, not a lot of people around, and it's very relaxing. Very relaxing. It, it kind of evolved all from having a love for the Finnish work, and apparently is in my blood because I've always gone back to the canoes. I started reading some books about fly fishing and went out and got a seven-foot Fenwick fiberglass rod and tried my luck. And for the first two or three years, to be honest, I didn't catch a damn trout. And I said, you know, I don't know how it's happened, but I've gone from rolling stones to kidney stones in the blink of an eye. (laughs) It's like way too fast to ride. How did this happen? But it's been a great ride. Welcome to Flyline Podcast, where we enjoy the interesting stories behind the legendary guides and luminaries connected to Maine fishing. I'm Michael Jones. Today, we'll be talking with our special guest, Jeff Davis. Jeff Davis owns and operates the Maine Fly Company in Yarmouth, Maine. During the past two years working on the podcast and in our routine connections with members of the Maine fishing community, the Maine Fly Company has continued to come up in conversations. For this reason, I was intrigued and wanted to learn more about the people behind this growing brand that was getting a lot of attention from people that I respect in our community. Jeff Davis grew up in Lewiston, Maine, and shares a great description of being raised and influenced by a highly driven and motivating mother that instilled in him a hard work ethic and stoic traits that helped to shape him in his personal and professional development. In this fun episode, we sat down with Jeff and discussed his unique background in the corporate world that ultimately led him to pursue a vision that was burning inside him to inspire the Maine fishing community with equipment that was handcrafted by Mainers, utilizing state-of-the-art materials and cutting-edge technology, while blending it carefully with the tapestry of Maine's cultural heritage of tackle and technology that has been carefully designed and refined for over the last 150 years of history. At the Maine Fly Company, every rod model has a unique story and purpose, and anyone that is inspired by a particular fishing river in Maine will quickly relate to the approach that the Maine Fly Company brings to each model, with careful emphasis placed on the model's design, artful aesthetic, with purposeful function as the core driving principle to create the final product that you will hold in your hands as an heirloom piece as well as a damn good fishing rod. It comes with great pleasure to introduce the Flyline podcast audience to this unique Mainer, an entrepreneur that has a very colorful story to share with us about his growing and successful enterprise, the Maine Fly Company. Jeff Davis, welcome to the Flyline podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, we're here in in the Sparhawk Mill. Uh, shop's freshly closed, the river's in the background, and the mood is set. I was going to ask you to turn the white noise down and then I realized (laughs) it's the sound of a beautiful river. You have got a great working space here. I love it. You guys have really done something. I think it's a natural fit to have you on the podcast uh, because everyone's talking about you. Good. And I think that you bring a lot of energy to the community at a time when the community could use some more energy and you got some vision. But I really want to get the story told about who Jeff Davis is and what the main fly company is. And let's go back to the beginning, Jeff. Tell me about where you grew up. Well, I uh, grew up in Lewiston, Maine, in uh, French-Canadian Lewiston, Maine, with my mom, my two sisters, and for most of it, depending on what era, uh, across the street from a a house full of St. Joseph nuns, Mm. one of which was my aunt, who was a missionary. So I had very special uh, women in my life. I grew up predominantly with with a lot of women in a very French-Canadian culture, uh, where basically your job, you know, as a kid was... You know, play street hockey in the in the summer and some ice hockey in the winter for the local parish, whether you're good or bad. Uh, that would that part was indifferent, and I just had wonderful women surrounding me through all that early years. So I thought it was very nice. Did you go to public school? I went to public school. Uh, changed schools two or three times. You know, my mother was very non traditional, right? In the seventies and eighties, um, you know, sort of leading a, a young family by herself, and she was working for the local Lewis and Sun Journal at the time but always just trying to do a little better by us. And so what started in a small townhouse on one side of Lewiston turned into a little mid-level house to a little bit better one as we got into our high school years and I was the only sibling remaining. But mom was a grinder. Mom was an entrepreneur. Good for her. And so we moved, point being, in in a few different schools in my time there, but always in a a local public school somewhere in in Lewiston. So you're a Maine boy. I'm a Maine boy. I'm Maine at my heart. Left as as quick as I could after high school, 
dumped my hockey bag out, filled it up with clothes, threw it in the back of my truck and swore I'd never be back. And, you know, but I, I think that's, that's what a lot of young people need to do or some need to do. I needed to do, um, only to find, you know, the New England coast and Maine screaming for me to come back home in, in my later twenties. Where did you go? Well, first stop, uh, Buffalo, New York, I came back, uh, unpacked, repacked, then drove and lived on the beach down in Florida for, for a while to only then get recruited by the guy I had worked for in Buffalo, who then shipped me across the Gulf of Mexico into Houston, where I spent a good few years in Houston, uh, which I was supposed to go for a month. I, I, I couldn't stand the idea of 10 gallon hats and, and going into the wild west only to move there and learn. I absolutely loved that town. It was full of transplants. There was just millions of me from all over the country. And I ended up actually liking the little two-step places. What was the and industry you were working? This isn't sales. I was a telemarketer. I was a, oh, wow. I was learning the art of sales and the art of grinding and, and hustling. I, I was, I was non-traditional and, and untamed, a wild horse, if you will. And I'm trying to picture you this is out of high school oh fresh out of high school so you didn't go to college for, for no interesting no bypass take, take, take me from there where do what happened next well i mean i you know uh most people at that point are running off to college and doing all those things i i hated high school i i wasn't a school spirit guy i i found greater comfort being in the basement of my mom's you know my childhood home you know building things or creating things on a little workbench i used to work on uh, there are um, you know, at that point I didn't really understand my creative side. I didn't really understand my introversion. I didn't really understand the, my combination of skill set to what grounded me. And frankly, didn't really understand that until my forties. But at that time I, I knew one thing, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't school spirited enough to run off and go live in a dorm. And it just, it wasn't my calling at that point. Because your, your brand now is so iconic to sporting and particularly main sporting, were you doing any hunting or fishing as a young kid no. or is it? No, you weren't, right? No. Yeah. None of it. So you kind of came to that later in life. Oh, completely. Yeah. I was a, you know, I was a contact sport guy. I mean, I liked hockey and I wasn't the greatest hockey guy, but I loved hockey. Uh, I was a soccer guy. I really loved soccer. Picked up lacrosse in my thirties. Um, you know, but, but fast forwarding too much later and we can, I know we'll, we'll get there. You know, I was looking for my next best thing. I was looking for, you know, ways not to be sore for, for the next six days after one of my games on the field. Mm -hmm. uh, I never knew how to play soccer at a medium tone. I was either all or nothing. And so as you age, those recovery times lengthen. And I was training for triathlons for a period. And there was some pain with all that recovery. And, and I knew you know, what's next? Like what, what's, what, what do my forties look like? What, what do, how do I get to reconnect outdoors again without the pain and suffering that, that fits my current lifestyle? I had no idea what that was going to be. So what, let's go back to Houston. So you were successful down there. Yeah. And I think you started to do more in that, you know, on the, on the, let's call it professional level yeah, or maybe corporate world. Correct. Tell me about that. Yeah. I mean, at that point, you know, I'm 20 some years old. I'm a, I'm a young frog from Lewis in Maine. I didn't even know buildings this size existed and clubs and nightlifes. And, you know, so I was young and traveling and just had a natural ability to, 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 to chat mm -hmm. and be persuasive in my younger years. Houston and all that was certainly about navigating some of these large organizations, but I was a little more mute to their cultures because at that age, you're just more you know, you're more excited about what, what does after hours look like? You know, I'm here to make some money and make some checks. And sure, you're telling me I'm great at this? Yeah, that's fine. As long as the check clears, I'm, I'm ready to go see the nightlife and go see what Maine doesn't have to offer for me and, and what that, you know, coming of age really looks like. Little did I know, I was just laying the foundation for being a sales guy or a business development and all the things I turned into later when large business structures I should have picked up on some of the earlier signs that they weren't necessarily for me, but I was good at it. You get sucked into it, Jeff. If you're good at something, everyone encourages you, as you said, and you see a path, you see an opportunity, you know, you see that we call it the golden handcuffs. That's it. You know, you get that big check every two weeks and you go, man, I don't know if I can live without it. That's what it was. Yeah. I mean, I'm coming back home, you know, to visit my 20s and my buddies are home from college and eating ramen noodles and I'm pulling out rolls of money. Guys, I'm killing it down there. Like you should see, 
And it, dinner's on me. Totally. Yeah, right. But in reflecting as I got older, you know, it was a big cover up because I wasn't a good student. These guys were. And they all got accepted to colleges. And I didn't even try because I didn't think I had a shot. And so I was reinventing myself and fast forwarding only to later in life discover those steps are there for for a certain reason. And I, I would have done it differently. Um, but it also, you know, wouldn't have necessarily led to where we are today. And Main Fly would have never existed. Right. So how did how did you start to think about creating a fly company back in Maine? <laughs> you had a life experience. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, the the time traveling, I mean, I came home, you know, I'm still in my 20s at this point, but also coming home with something to prove. Like, look, I was on the road. I created this great experience. I was extremely competitive and was a top sales guy. And I'm going to bring that practice and stuff back home. The only thing is when I got back home, you know, there was an initial period of reflection, which is when I did return to college. So I was a non-traditional guy, went back to school, was staying in the sales world slightly, bartending at night, going to school in between those two things. And, you know, again, slowly starting to get into the creative side of myself, falling in love with the restaurant scene in Portland and the culinaries and oh, cool. befriending myself with the chefs and sous chefs and yeah. great bartenders. And next thing you know, I'm one of the great bartenders. And so I, you're in Portland now. I'm in Portland. Got it. Fast forward. I never returned to Lewiston. Got it. I come back to Maine. I say, I can't go back. So you left Houston, Houston, came back to Maine, found yourself working in Portland. Back in Portland. And when you were studying, where were you studying and what were you studying? So I didn't like school and I didn't have the credibility to get into anything decent. Yeah, and oh, so sorry. I went to SMCC. Nothing wrong with that. Well, that's where I'm going. Uh, little did I know, SMCC was a fantastic place for me to that's attend. Right. It was an excellent place for me to go. I tell people about it all the time and I still do. I think it's an unbelievable school and opportunity for not only those who are like me, who maybe didn't have the greatest high school experience or just didn't really give it to the... When you're going back or you're trying something new, SMCC is a very welcoming, their instructors, their professors are, 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 are really keen to that. And it was just a really welcoming place for me to return to, right. which little did I know I was going to turn into an academic junkie and uh, stay in school for about five years, uh, getting high honors in every graduation. I was magna cum laude. I went from this guy who hated it to learning to appreciate it to having a great experience to them grooming me to, you know, to transfer into USM and, and, to, and to really have a, you know, as good of a degree as I could have knowing I wasn't going to do anything with it. It was a, it was a personal resume thing that I wanted to accomplish. If you had to describe when in your life this was, when was that? Late twenties heading into my thirties. Yeah, thank you. I didn't mean that. Uh, it was, you know, you're traveling, you're, you're wild time, you come back home, you kind of reground what's next. Let me get this foundational thing under under my belt. At that time, my brother-in-law was incredibly successful with AT&T. The wireless industry was starting to take off. And he said, Jeff, if you can get into this wireless world and I'm the landline guy together, we're going to do great. My brother-in-law was the envy of my family. He was the he was making great money. He was providing a great life for my sister. I said, great. Let me get an AT&T wireless. Let me start selling wireless and see what all that looks like. Oh, there you go. Knew I needed college. So I did that and transitioned easily into, into a sales role uh, for them. Only to fast forward five years later, uh, I'm selling franchises, um, owning one a shop of my own, hence the start of my entrepreneurial life. And um, only adding another layer to the concept that big business just wasn't for me. And, uh, you know, fast forward, ended up closing my shop to help build my mother's small business and work with her. Good. Um, what was she doing, Jeff? So my mom was a grinder. I mean, my mom did all kinds of things, ended up being an administrator uh, back when medical practices existed and they weren't owned by three conglomerates. And she ran a, a practice in Portland. The three doctors that owned it ended up uh, breaking up and dividing. And uh, she took her skill set and decided to start her own physician billing service. I remember as a young kid coming home from maybe middle school, high school, early high school, I'd come home walking down Weber Avenue in Lewiston, Maine, and my mother is on the front porch with a cordless phone with the antenna pulled out three feet with the yellow pages on her lap, and she's cold calling. She's cold calling doctor offices to pick up accounts. I mean, grinding at a time when this was very unusual, right? Most of the women on our road are, you know, old French Canadian ladies, and they were inside, and they were 
doing the things that older French Canadians did at that Were you French Canadian? That's my, that's my, my mom's heritage, LePage. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Carpentier, all yeah, that. Yeah, sure. So mom's, uh, you know, meanwhile on the front porch grinding and starting her business. Yeah. And she did that very successfully for 25 years until she retired. Yeah. Lived life on her own terms and, you know, really taught me everything I needed to know about, um, you know, the real values of a, of a mom pop shop, how you treat it, how you answer people, how you, how you behave, mm. what this looks like. Yeah, the ethics and integrity. In a non-digital world. That's right. It's a lot of those practices that we use today at Main Fly Company. I learned that from my mom. Yeah. Let's talk about your dad. Can, can we go there? Yeah, happy to. Yeah, yeah. please. Tell me yeah. about your dad. So dad throughout it all was a good man. He didn't grow up like the rest of us. You know, he grew up in, in the heat of uh, the Carolinas down in the south. Um, his uh, uh, dad was a traveling sales guy who popped into town, had an affair with his, my dad's mom at the time. His name is Mav. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful lady. Um, and uh, my father was a product of that. Oh, wow. So through, you know, genograms and all these things, we later learned out that Willie, Willie J. Davis, ironically, my dad's William J. Davis. I'm also William J. Davis, um, had a whole nother family. And so at a very young age, my dad's mom took her own life and he was suddenly found himself in the Carolinas with his grandmother raising. And then she passed and he's a teenager, no place to go. Ends up with some distant relatives. They get him. I don't want you. They threw him in the military. At that point, he could get in at a young age. He gets in the military uh, with no other place to go. Dad lands at Brunswick Naval Air Station. So he's in the Navy. Yeah. Which is where dad meets mom. Ah. That's where dad uh, learns about Maine. That's where dad learns about the landlocked salmon. That's where dad makes his first visit to L.L. Bean and becomes a fly fishing junkie Got on the it. side. And so that's what brings them up here. Um, but through their divorce, which was a very young age, I was maybe two at the time, um, you know, dad at that age, which was not also untraditional, you know, turned to the bottle and, and drank. And he couldn't deal with the pain of losing his family. And so with every new job and new gig he got, he ended up another state away. First it was New Hampshire, then it was Mass, then it was New York. Uh, when I ended up, you know, getting him at the, at the end of life, that was out in Chicago. Not that he was trying to get away from us. He All he wanted was us. I was the only son. I, he was obsessed with me. Uh, we just weren't that tight. And his, you know, iron fist at the time, very part-time versus my mom's really laissez-faire, you know, it was a clash. It's, it's the story of millions and millions of kids in every generation that we can think of with separated parents. I think a lot of people can relate to what you just said, Jeff. Completely. Yeah. And there's pain and the parents are in pain and the kids are in pain. And that comes through in the form of splitting where mom kind of gives you latitude to do what you want. Dad comes around and says, I want you to be the man you're supposed to be. But when dad's very part-time, you're not really listening to dad, yeah, knowing he, you can fall back on mom. He doesn't have any street cred. He lost it. Yeah. He's popping in town for the weekend and thinking that we're just going to pick up where we left off. Yeah. I'm sorry, dad. I just had six more months of experiences mm. in this latitude with mom. So that's what that ends up looking like. You don't realize those things until you become a man and you're older and you say, man, I would have treated him differently under these circumstances and these and these. Dad and I, you know, really had connections in many ways and disconnections in a million others. In my earlier years, I expressed the idea of wanting to be a creative and a maker, but in the form of cartoons and drawing. Right. He told me that was ridiculous. Yeah. Dad was a conservative in that way. Get a good job that pays the bills, invest your money, spend wisely. I'm wanting to take chances and roll the dice. Fast forward a few years later, I wanted to be a chef. I wanted to cook. I wanted to create. Mm -hmm. I always fell back on the maker side of it. Don't do that. You can't do that. You're not going to, you're not going to make it. You're not good enough. You need to get into sales. You do the safe thing. That's a big ironic twist as we lead up to what led to main flight company. Um, because that's when I finally took the chance mm -hmm. was after he passed. That's right. But up until then, all I wanted to do was make him proud. So let's go to the day that he passed in that time. Yeah. Um, at that point, right. I'm, I'm cemented in, in corporate structures, uh, unhappy, not healthy the way I should be. I've got a uh, wife pregnant with twin sons. We're months away from, from these boys being born. 
I am in a very, very confusing period in my life. I know I'm getting ready to father uh, some children. My wife was 10 years younger than I was. So she was much more ready. I'm 40 years old at this point. I'm untraditional. Um, but I was trying to pave the way and I said, look, I, I, I have to do what I have to do and I have to keep this job because it's got great benefits. It's great, great money. Um, and all of a sudden one night my phone rings around two or three in the morning. I, it, it's just one of those things that happens. You know, you have to answer and you know, it's going to be bad. I've got the call before. Yeah. I know what you went through. Sorry that I had to. My wife's in bed. I didn't even want to disturb her. I answer the call. I don't say anything. Your dad just died. Yeah. Uh, I go downstairs. I cry it out a few hours. I go back upstairs. I try to go back to bed. Wife wakes up. What happened? My dad died. Um, you know, I sat for half a day. Uh, my sisters, you know, everybody just kind of took it in their own way. I was the only one in a position at that point to basically fly out to Chicago. My dad's partner named Stella, a wonderful woman. Uh, she's lost, doesn't know what to do. Um, so I fly out a few days later and help sort things out. Um, and it was, a, it was a period of time that, you know, changed my life for many, many, many reasons. Um, but in part of that, I end up, you know, out there, I'm sad, I'm, I'm confused. Uh, there's a twisted sense of small sense of relief uh, as much as there is grief, I no longer have to prove myself to him. I no longer have to uh, do all these 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 uncomfortable dynamics that we had. But I miss him. But the good news was is that something in my gut warned me, because Dad wasn't great at that point. His Parkinson's was kicking on. He'd not been drinking for a long, long time at that point. It was Parkinson's and other things that he had developed. And I flew into Chicago maybe a year earlier. And I said, you know what? You talk about your hometown. You talk about all this stuff. You need to go home and see your home again. I'm thinking to myself, you probably will never get a chance to see it again, but I'm just pitching them on the idea. We're talking about Maine. No. Oh, the Carolinas. Oh, okay. Sorry. So I fly in Chicago. I got a job at the time. I'm traveling constantly. So I fly into Carolinas. I, I get on a plane with him. He couldn't walk. He was in a wheelchair, the whole thing. Fly him into Carolinas. He gives me a full tour of Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, brings me to his birth home where he had never been to the uh, cemetery with the stones that he later purchased for his mom and grandmother. You got to see those. This wonderful connection that we had, had never really had. Bittersweet. We had a week of it. Yeah. And I had a feeling when I put him on that plane, that man's never going to travel again. I didn't know he was about to pass. So there was a little bit of relief that this, this son-father gesture that I had made, you know, um, the timing couldn't have been better. Um, but you know, it really led to a lot of the confusion of being out there. And, and so I go out and anyway, she's sad. She can't really cope. She doesn't, you know, she's having a hard time. She's a wonderful woman. Uh, just was caught off guard. I started going through his stuff. I'm like, oh, there's going to be a will or there's some directive somewhere around here. And we're going through cabinets and drawers. And mm -hmm. all I ended up discovering is my dad was a hoarder. I mean, there was more stuff there than 10 men need. Um, but after a few days, you know, I made some very difficult decisions about what we we're going to do with his body and ended up putting his corpse on a plane and flying it back to Maine and burying him in a French Canadian cemetery next to my mom's parents where he'd roll over if he knew that's where he was. Um, but it's almost my final punishment to him for not telling us what to do with him. And so I either left him out in Chicago, uh, sent him to a, uh, military, um, cemetery in the Carolinas where he would never be seen or I brought him back home, which was his best shot at any visits, if depending on what you believe. And probably part of his heart went pitter pat in Maine as well, right? Totally. Yeah. So let's, let's, he also left you something else in that hoard, in that well, hoarded area. Yeah. I mean, in that pile, right, there's, there's, there's tools and maps and all this stuff. And of course the beloved fly fishing collection, um, wasn't something we shared a lot of as a young, young, young man. When he'd come to town on, on the daddy weekends, we'd go to Lake Auburn and throw a spin rod out for a perch or whatever we could find out in the corner of Lake Auburn. But meanwhile, dad was angling and he was angling down in, in, in New York. And in the short time I was with him in New York, he tried to get me up at six in the morning, five in the morning to fish as a seven, eighth grade kid. And like, yeah, be out of your mind. I'm an eighth grader. Like I want to sleep till noon if I can't like get out of here. So I discover all this stuff. The bittersweet part is all the tools in my father's term was turn loose. 
In other words, like drop what you're touching. Don't touch that. And I kept thinking of that as I was touching all this stuff and his nets and his waders and his rods and all this stuff. And he, he, part of that also was he had an old Nissan. So I took his car and I stuffed it with tools, fishing gear, and memorabilia for my, for my siblings. And drove it across country and drove it back home. Didn't know what I was going to do with it. Nothing spoke to me just yet. Where was home at that point? North Yarmouth. Perfect. So I'm confused. I decide to take some time off from work. I have this mini barn in the backyard. Uh, I decide to build it with his tools, with his nails, only his stuff as a way to heal and sit outside and just mourn. So I sat out there for two weeks. Had two weeks changed my life. From bucks walking in my yard to eagles landing on the top of my house, this van that went by this one day down North Road, it just said Davis on the side of it. I'm like, I've never seen, Google the business, don't have any idea who they are. It was every sign in the world that if something exists and that past loved one is watching you, I was on center stage. And when that period of time was done and I sat looking at this erected structure that I would built, which I had no experience to do, but I thought it came out wonderful. I then carved out a big fish out of plywood, had my mother-in-law at the time paint it. And I put a brook trout in the front of it. And it was my memory of dad. And it was a tribute to dad. However, I knew for sure I was not going back to an office. You were going through a change. You were going through a big change. I was going through a massive change. Yeah, good for you. And um, I realized how much I loved being outdoors yeah. and how much I had lost touch of that being in a booth or cubicle working corporate, yeah. how much I enjoyed working with my hands and was embracing the splinters and calluses that I had created. Uh, and I knew that I just didn't, wasn't going back yeah. to what I had done. In part of all that, uh, my brother-in-law at the time and father-in-law at the time were into fly fishing. And I said, guys, I got these fly rods. I not really... Let me show you how to do all this. So next thing you know, I'm casting and I'm like, God, this is. Let, let's stop there for a second. Because I didn't miss, I think I misunderstood you. But I want to pick up from right there, Jeff. Um, you had all this equipment and you said to them, uh, I have all this stuff. Let's go do this. Did you say, I want to show you how to do this? Or did someone say, I want to show you, Jeff, how to do this? No, they wanted to show me. Right. So, t so let's start there. My fly fishing casting stroke was ridiculous. I looked like a horse trainer with a whip. You were self-trained. Totally. Right. I mean, if, if <clears throat> Lou Zambello who does fly school with us now and tells people, you're not throwing a football, get your, you know, you're, you're, uh, you would have shamed me to death back in those days. At that point, it was more just me identifying what I had there for equipment. Was I planning to do anything with this? And I've got a fly rod, might as well learn to swing it. That part didn't really sell me. It was not long after that. They said, look, let's go take a, a, a fishing trip. Let's go put this stuff into practice and see what, what that looks like. And so we find ourselves on a few trips. I'm terrible. I couldn't catch anything. It wasn't the point. I was coming off the river skunked with a horrible cast with no tact whatsoever. But I felt clean. I felt cleansed. Uh, my phone is not working. In fact, the first trip I ever went on, I fell in the dead river, uh, floated down river while my waders were submerged. My phone got fried mm -hmm. within minutes of my first trip. It was almost like the, the world was saying, put the damn phone away and understand what, what you're, what you're, you're, you're going through right now. Embrace what's around you. It forced me to do it. And that trip changed my life forever. I wasn't good at it. I didn't want to be, I didn't need to be. I tell people every day when they come in the shop, if 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 you're you're starting this because of the fish, you're wrong. Fall in love with the river. Fall in love with disconnecting. Fall in love with the sounds that we're hearing in the background. Connect, and all the fish are the bonus after that. I I was connecting at that point, not even realizing. Well, the the, the thing about the sport I think is lost on a lot of people that are into other sports like golf is that. Um, you know, there's so many different facets to fly fishing. Mm. What you're talking about, Jeff, is there's relationships. Mm. You could, I mean, you might find somebody that does nothing but tie flies. They don't ever even fish. They just love to tie flies. I know people that are incredible fly tires that are terrible fishermen. I know people that are great fishermen that are terrible fly tires. Um, you could study knots. You could teach casting. There's so many, and you 
make fly rods. So there's just so many facets to this thing that to me, it never grows tiring. And, and I can see, I'm really happy to know that you're getting into it at your age because you got a long road of love and learning and friendships. And it's like all going to continue to unfold for you. Um, I've never regretted a day that I, you know, became a professional fly fisherman. It, it's been a tremendously rewarding experience. And it's a thrill. Yeah. It, it's an absolute thrill. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I've, I've created my own lane in, in this fly fishing world that, that, you know, is filled, you know, with so many talented people. Um, but it was, it was that trip and it was the trip that was right after it where I'm sitting on the side of the river with one of his rods and I start looking at this rod and I'm like, huh, you know, like people, from what I understand, fly fishermen are very particular. Like they all have their own recipes. This rod like the wraps are all different sizes and the guide is looks crooked and this can't be very hard to build. Why would this big rod company have such a weird looking? So I pulled out a knife and I started chipping off one of the guides. And I'm like, that's all this is. I can do this better than, than this. And so all part of this same few week period, I buy this little starter kit, find myself in the basement, a laptop, in a book I bought off Amazon on how to build fly rods. Have you admitted to your wife at this point that you're quitting your job and you're no. Quit? okay? No, yeah, you're no. just playing around. God, no. you're yeah, playing around. Yeah, totally. Got it. Uh, boys are uh, on the earth. They're they're here. All these things are happening. Uh, I'm having a major transformation uh, internally, spiritually, in every possible way. Next thing you know, I'm in the basement building this rod. It took me days to get through. I couldn't even tie the initial knots. But next thing I'd know, five hours had passed. My heart rate was slow. My mind was still. I'm thinking, God damn, I feel like I just came off the river. Like, it's, this is all resonating with me. Like, building rods feels this way too? What is this fly fishing? It's taking me over right now. And and so next thing you know, I'm I'm building a rod. And I get my brother-in-law at the time to build a rod. And we're like, all right. So, of course, I want to build another one. And then to me, it was another one. And then it was another one. And then I'm like, I think I can do this better. Um, not understanding the mechanics of carbon and, and not, none of that. I can make a cleaner looking rod, but really enjoy doing this. Fast forward, right? Early, maybe mid 2018. Uh, you know, at this point I've, I've worked through the sales world. I've been a sales manager. Now I'm a, I, I'm a, cons I've been a consultant for years and now I'm consulting for the university. And so I've been building businesses for others forever. The branding and the marketing was always my favorite. So I have this new hobby. I'm going to create a brand on this hobby. I'm going to create a logo. Eh, I don't care if this is a hobby or business. It doesn't matter. I'm enjoying myself. I'm going to put a little brand behind this and I'm going to have some fun. Jeff, let's take a short break and we'll come back and we're going to pick up with the genesis of the main fly company. Sure. On this Flyline Flashback episode, we will discuss some history surrounding the naming of the Dead River in Maine. The Dead River in Maine played an important role in the history of the American Revolution. If you travel north on Route 201 from Bingham, Maine, you will be driving along the Benedict Arnold Trail, parallel to the Kennebec River's main stem. Benedict Arnold was born in 1740 in Connecticut. He grew to become a merchant, operating ships in the Atlantic during the period of the French and Indian War, around 1755. Arnold joined the growing American army outside of Boston and distinguished himself by acts that demonstrated intelligence and bravery. During one particular military siege by the French in upstate New York, Arnold was forced to retreat as a way of self-preservation. A commonly accepted story that Benedict Arnold deserted from militia service at this period is based on unproven documentary evidence, or lack thereof. In the fall of 1775, the newly commissioned Colonel Benedict Arnold led a force of 1,100 men on a grueling trip through Maine as part of the invasion of Canada. Ascending the Kennebec using bateau dories, they avoided the rapids of the Lower Dead River via a portage of about 12 miles at the Great Carrying Place between what is known today as Wyman Lake and Caratunk, Maine. This portage brought the troops to a position above what is known now as Long Falls Dam, returning to the river above the dangerous rapids. This portage was known by the Native Americans living in this section of the river. That helped the advancing troops to navigate around the otherwise impassable upstream section. 
It was during this grueling expedition that Arnold and his troops were forced to hunker down for a complete main winter to conduct repairs and simply survive if at all possible. Of the original 1,100 men that were being led and commanded by Benedict Arnold, 300 turned back and 200 perished over this hard main winter, living in crude conditions and teetering on starvation, hypothermia, and disease. The following spring, they proceeded up the north branch of the Dead River through the chain of ponds to Arnold Pond in Coburg Gore and crossed the height of land into the watershed of Quebec's Chaudier River. This section of the Dead River was formerly referred to as the West Branch of the Kennebec. Based on the history surrounding the Benedict Arnold expedition, this section of the Upper Kennebec has been officially and aptly renamed the Dead River. And now let's return to the second part of our show. Well, Jeff, welcome back from the break. You shared some really heartfelt things in the first half, and I appreciate you doing that because I know that's not those are not easy things to talk about. But they're so transferable to so many other people, you know, div- divorced families, um, you know, an absent father. These are the things that mold your life, that that force you down the path that you've come down uh, or guide you down the path, maybe. And, you know, we left off with you talking about you inheriting your your father's collection and you finding yourself in the basement tinkering with building fly rods. Let's pick up from there. Yeah, you know. At that time, right, I'm also living a very loud lifestyle. I'm, um, you know, I'm corporate. I've got newborns upstairs. I've, I've got a marriage on the rocks. I'm mostly because of my sour corporate attitude. And so externally, I fall in the rivers. Internally, I'm discovering the art of the fly rod. And so, you know, as I'm building these and, and hours are passing and time is passing, um, they, they, just keep, they just kept getting better. I decided to brand this thing. You know, here comes the main fly logo. Again, um, not caring. This is going to be a business or a hobby. I didn't carry the way. This wasn't about outfacing. This was in facing. This was my soul. This was my mind. This felt good. It made me understand the artists, the chefs, the painters. Um, I brand it. Heading into the 2019, I'm going to build a website. I don't know how to build a website. I find platforms where websites exist. Found the most vanilla thing I could find. Threw the logo on it. Started an Instagram page. Started teasing that this business was coming. It was only for the five people that knew what I was doing. I was just really socially teasing my my extended family is all this was. In March 2019, I had done some teasing. I launched the website 9 a.m. Announcing I'm launching this thing at 9 a.m. At that point, I had no product. I announced this company as if it's a thing. I had six rods total to sell. Again, it was a hobby. I had no idea what was about to happen. Launched the website. Didn't go off the way it was supposed to. I'm instantly on a support call. Okay, hold, hold on. Where are we in 2019? Because you're, we're really talking about the beginning of COVID. Yeah. Yeah, so when are we? I'm in the basement. We're at the beginning of 2019. Beginning, so okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm down yeah. in South America, just about to come home, and it's about to become That's right. the coronavirus. We had no idea. <clears throat> yeah. At this point, my, my consulting work is booming with the university. There's all kinds of things happening. The, the world is loud. Um, I get on, I get on support. All of a sudden, my phone starts going cha-ching, cha-ching, and the lady on the phone can hear me. And she's like, well, is that coming from your end? She goes, that's really good. I'm like, I have no idea what that even means. She goes, every time that happens, it means your website's getting a sale. Cha-ching, 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 lighting up in the opening hour of the, of the website. She's like, do you understand what's happening? I have no idea. I don't think it's working. She goes, oh, it's working. Next thing I know, I'm selling swag that I don't even have. Okay, I'm, I'm on print by demand. I didn't have anything. Every rod, we had, everything was gone day one. I love it. I said, holy, what? Who are these? Most of them I knew. A lot of them I didn't. Somehow I had reached a few people. I'm not talking a lot of money here, right? We're, we're, we're talking you know, hundreds of dollars. Yeah. It was not the point. This was supposed to go live. This was, a, this was a fun thing for me and a few friends. That was it. This was your Etsy page. That's all yeah, it was. Right, yeah. So at that point, I quickly say, all right, we need some more rods. So I go back on the other side of the basement. I start building more rods. At this point, I said, well, it's time to brand these things. What's this first one going to be called? I didn't know any rivers at the time. I knew the uh, the Rapid River. 
So I did a rapid river rod. It was a four weight with a, a cork spacer on my reel seat, uh, green on green. I thought it was the coolest thing I had ever done. Uh, all of them a little bit different. I, I, I still have the original one. Um, and things sort of developed from there. Yeah. Uh, year one, no, not a lot of great sales, but a great experience that I was doing on the side or on everything else I had going on in my life. Well, and maybe in some ways, Jeff, you didn't need it to explode. You needed to get your feet underneath you. That's it. That's it. I started taking the show on the road a little bit uh, in my spare time, walking to a, one local fly shop not far from me here. The owner lights me up. Um, in a good way? Bad way. Okay. Um, the average person at that point goes home with tail between the legs and says, okay, this is not for me. I shouldn't be talking about this. I frankly did quite the opposite. You're not the average person. I'm not going to let somebody talk to me like that mm -hmm. and, and shut this new passion down. In fact, it only drove me. So I let that particular place be a benchmark of where I needed to be and what I needed to get to. And so from that, I started making more rods. And next thing you know, boom, a national pandemic hits. The university kicks everybody off the campus. I no longer have any work to do for my regular job. I'm home. I'm paid to be home to do what? They didn't have anything for us. So I'm building rods. At that point, I said, I'm not keeping up. Hire a couple people. My mother-in-law at the time, who is a painter artist, the best builder I probably have ever had, this other young lady um, who both come join me uh, initially with masks. Well, not my mother-in-law, the other one with masks. I train them the best that I know how, which at the time was as good as I knew. Send them all home to start building stuff. They start delivering me rods by the week. All right. What next? You called it 1099 earlier. They're all independent contracts. That's right. I love it. I paid them by the piece. Yeah. You go home and you build me this. And if it looks like the way I tell you it's supposed to look like when it's done, then great. But it was more of a way, you know, for me to start spreading this wonderful thing that I discovered that I could potentially potentially make money doing this new thing that I loved, which was the opposite of what I've known my professional life to be yeah. for the last 20 years. People are like, are you doing this for your dad? I'm like, I don't know if I'm doing this for him. Right. So your father didn't leave you with a trust fund and you started a fly rock company. <laughs> no, no. My father left me with nothing but a hoard and a whole lot of confusion. Um, but I think that's attributed to some of our, our, our early momentum and and part of our success is that I think people can can connect with the idea that this was not a company that was based on donations or years of experience or I left another rod company to come create my own. This was pain. This was suffering. This was healing. This was middle of life being lost. Um, and when it comes to a gamble, oh, it's easier for him to say I can I can't afford to take that gamble. I've got kids. Well, I had infants. Uh, it wasn't a worse time. For me to do this. The passion was just so strong. I took that chance and, and, you know, and, and I pray every day it continues and I, and I work hard to ensure that it does, but this was loss. This was, this was also around the same time, you know, my mom who was my anchor, you know, getting diagnosed with, with Alzheimer's and dementia as my anchor and my, my small business connection. My uncle had just passed of dementia and my dad, and so this was pain. This was grieving. This was reflecting and looking at my parents with love and admiration, but also saying, I don't want my kids to go through what I'm going through right now. I need to leave a better legacy. I need to look back and say, you know, he, he lived it on his term. And it was a massive bit life change for me. But it was, it was really on pain and grieving that led us to where we are today. And you wanted to, you want to set an example for them. Um, maybe the example your, your own father didn't set. Well, I think it's, I think it's incredibly easy as a parent, right, to, you know, coach our kids and what we want to do as long as we're living that same passion internally. To me, it's me as a parent feeling unfulfilled, telling my, my, leading my young boys, this is what you need to be doing. Am I leading by example or words? It's words. Now I'm leading by example. And to me, that's a proud moment as a dad. I think a lot of people can relate to that, Jeff. And you're also a smart business guy, Jeff, and you saw something. You, we're not talking about the elephant in the room. You knew from all of your background with corporate and, and brand building and marketing, this wasn't exi This didn't exist in Maine. Didn't exist. And it was waiting to be taken, and you took it. Well, and it's real. It's a real thing. This is a viable 
I want one of your rods. I want all of your rods, right? I want to get rid of my corporate stuff and buy all your stuff because I think it's cool. It looks cool. Um, back to you building rods. You've gotten real good at it, man. I, I mean, I don't, I don't give away flattering compliments to anybody. Your rods look fantastic. Thank you. Um, I got Sherry a brand new custom rod that your team made at Christmas time. I look that thing over from, from, but to tip, and there isn't a single mistake, and it's all perfect. And the guides are the, the wraps are ideal, they're gorgeous. Yeah. They're and and but what you've done, Jeff, and I don't mean to take you away from what you were talking no, about. No, 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 no. I think it's really important for the audience to understand that the the business model is not just making a fly rod, it's making something that somebody can say, I am probably one of the only people that has this exact one. Now, people could do that 100 years ago if they went and got a custom cane fly rod. Mm -hmm. They had to be a doctor or a lawyer. They had to have a lot of money. Jeff can build this artistic connection with the with the crafter, in your case, your team or you, and say, Jeff, would you build me a rod that, that I want it to be like this? Can we do that together? Class to the mass. You're making something for people they can have the rest of their life. No one's going to get rid of a main fly company fly rod. It's not going to be something they shove in the corner. It's going to be something that's going to be their primary. I hope so. Yeah. You, know, I, I you sure. take it from there. What do you, I mean, what did you know about the business at that point? You felt there was an opening. Well, look, I mean, I, I certainly sprinkled in and, and, you know, skipped a lot of the parts of some market research, you know, visiting, you know, a foundational main company who also sells rods to walk in and say, Hey, which one of your local locations builds rods? And they looked at me and laughed. We don't build anything. Huh? Who does? Well, Orvis built them all. Oh, great. So I reach out to them. Oh, we built the top 10%. Oh, well, who else? This other company, Mass. They, Who else? That's pretty much it for around here. Who's representing Maine? I kept saying, who's representing Maine? Mm. Who's representing the state that I love? Who's representing these waters? This, I couldn't find it. Well, there was very few, and there are single rod makers. That's it. You know, they're the David Van Burgles of the world. There's only a few. Those are the people I discovered in the research. Right. Those are the people whose stories that I, I I reached out to, talked to family members, learned a little bit about some of these folks, and learned that it was a very expiring demographic. I don't want to confuse this. Main Fly Company, to me, is not one of these 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 older guys in northern Maine who's planing cane for three weeks to make a stunning bamboo. That's not what we are. I'm a hybrid version to keep the art of the rodsmith alive. It's very much ingrained into our heritage and culture in Maine. And to be that representation of the lost art of the rodsmith in these really small batch rods that we make. And the small batch was my way of bucking corporate, which is everything that I just left. You're right. not going to tell me how many of these I need to make. No. I don't need to make a thousand of anything. No. In fact, I can make three and say, I'm done. There'll never be another McGalloway again. We're shifting. That's the idea of small batch, right? that everybody, and like you alluded to a few minutes ago, I want the guy on the river who's, who's, who's swinging one of our roach five weights, look down the river and not see another one. He's got one of a finite version of that rod that's as unique as he is as an angler. That's to me what was missing. We're all going in mass production. We're looking at these mass produced rods, yet we all have our own way of mending a line. But this special fly, and we can only be here at this time of day. And we've all got these unique recipes, but we're swinging all this mass produced stuff, which are the founders of our industry. No disrespect. Main fly was to give you that unique fish stick and that experience. And then as we evolved more into a business and more into a lifestyle sort of brand, when I created the shop, I wanted you to come in and have an experience that you weren't going to have anyplace else. Well, it worked for me. I can tell you this, Jeff. I came in here with no agenda. I met Garland. Uh, I was planning on maybe buying a rod. I knew I was going to buy a rod within inside of five minutes. You know why? I wanted to have a partnership with your team because I like what you guys were doing. It felt good. It felt right. Um, but the other thing that you didn't say, which I think is also a little bit of an elephant in the room, is because of the Portland experience you had, and understanding craft beer and understanding uh, farm to table food, right? See where I'm going? Mm. You saw, mm. I mean, how many people do I know that have moved to Maine since COVID and during COVID that want a piece of Maine? And there's a lot of people that learned how to fly fish more recently. They're getting into the sport. Thank you for doing that. That don't want to buy a sage entry level $300 rod 
when they can have a mid to high end main fly company rod for three hundred dollars. I mean, I think I paid four hundred dollars for Sherry's rod. Yeah, it's like an eight hundred dollar rod, Jeff. I know it's I'm, beautiful. I'm shamed for our prices a lot often. You could b- bring your prices up. I I. I'm the, glad you don't though. But thank you. Going. Yeah, yeah. But back I, to the cottage farm to table. Let's yeah, go well, there. It it, 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 it it it's a huge correlation. You know, I mean, at this time, right? I mean, I'm I'm one of these young guys in the world that when Lavertiers and uh, um, what was my Bonos and all these little shops from Lewiston got got closed out because Walmart pulled into town and bought everybody out. I missed small business. To me, COVID had a lot of silver linings, and in the heat of COVID, there was a massive. Uh, uh, bucking to corporate because people were home and they didn't want to return back to the offices after they had a chance to be home and realize they could be productive. But also there was a million people like me who didn't have anything to do for their job. So they started hobbies and crafts and things on the side and realized I'm happier doing this. Hence the resurgence of small business. Correlate that with my love of food and, and my connection with the brewery boom in Maine. And the idea that you'd walk into a brewery You could see the beer getting made. You're in a tasting room where only X amount of what they've ever, they've made in the last month is available to you. You can taste it. You can talk to the guy who made it and have this really industrial experience while tasting this craft product. I always wanted a part of that. I just, I decided to do it in the fly fishing. You did it. I did it in the form of a fly rod and fly fishing and deviated from the standard fly shop to try to create that small business creative environment that you can feel inspired by. And now you have a chance to come in our shop and design anything you want and we'll build it for you. Yeah, but okay. So this is this is another tangent that, that's really important for, for um, the audience to understand, the listeners. Yeah, you can make a beer, but if people don't want to drink it, then that all that is just romantic. Yeah. And one of the things that I've noticed about your line is every rod tells a story. Yeah. Can we go there? Sure. Give me a couple. Give me like tell me about the tell me about the Roach River. Tell yeah. me about the Roach River. Yeah, there's not a single rod on that. Because they all this, let me let me finish this before you go down that road, Jeff. Every one of them has an aesthetic yeah. connection to you. Mm-hmm. They do. I mean, it, it's incredibly important. The earlier ones didn't as much. As my travels, you know, expand and I I venture more through Maine and explore. And I've never, my claim to fame has never been. I'm the best angler in Maine. I don't, that's not why I do it, but I really value the trips and the travels we're taking. And I take something away from most of those travels. Let's get into the roach. You know, the roach is not a river that's, that's unnamed that most anglers haven't, haven't fished. I just was able to groom myself as an angler through experiences, through friends who were guides, who would take me into Kakajo, who was helping me with my game but I, I found a real special connection with a few spots on that river. And so this one trip um, was probably my greatest landlock adventure that I had ever had. And that's not hard to do when you've only been at it for eight years or seven years. I mean, every year is better than the last, which is awesome. But this particular day, you know, the little rusted bridge at you into Kakajo, it's not really rusted. There's sections of uh, fly fishing only, Kakajo, population not many. I I tell the story often. I love it. But there was a chip of rust on the bridge. And so I grabbed that little chip of rust and I stuffed it in my waders. We're on this little honey hole. It was fall, which is the time of year we'd go. And I grabbed a bunch of leaves on the trail on the way down and shoved my waders. Didn't know what I was going to do with them. I knew I'd get back to it later. This one little hole we were nymphing. And at the time, my technique wasn't necessarily the best. And I said, man, if this rod was only six inches longer, I could access and drop right over the top of where these, these fish are all hovering. And so I returned, you know, back to my home and I said, I'm going to build a nine, six, the color of the rod is going to be the rust on that bridge. And the wraps are going to be all the leaves that I shoved in my waders. And so I laid it all out, took some colored pencils, drew the, the rod out, put out an RFP for the blanks, got the blanks and put my favorite shape grip, which I call the Fenwick. Uh, the only rod we ever did with nickel silver on the hardware, which to me was supposed to be representative of of the quality trips that I was taking because most real seats have aluminum hardware. And so I threw nickel silver on that thing, um, put a little bit of a glare because of the sun that I remember coming off the river where most of my rods have a matte finish. 
um, and did this in a nine, six format and a four five skipped the six intentionally and went straight to a seven weight, uh, knowing that a lot of the, uh, landlocked salmon anglers, uh, like to choose sevens or even the steelies. And so hence came the Roach River rod, which was a complete tribute to my time of learning, which I, uh, my beloved landlocked salmon and my adventures, uh, of learning to uh, chase them. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. But of course you, you you're not. Limited to only fish the Roach River with your Roach no. River rod, nor no. any of your rods limited to you know no. the water. It's just the inspiration comes from that completely. Yeah. So do tell me about the Megalloway because I'm about to buy one for you. <laughs> you know the Megalloway, right? I mean, in my experience, um, you know, and in so many of the stories and the books, and as I started reaching in the archives and the Kerry Stevens books and. The history. The history. Right? It's yeah. Western Maine. Yeah. I mean, the real history for us, right, is Northern Maine. But then the books and, and what's chronological at this point, it's Western. It's Rangely. It's that great history. And the McGalloway sits in the dead center of it. The McGalloway is also the first river we ever took a team trip, which is where our brand anthem video was shot. And what nobody knows in that video is I was the only guy who didn't catch a fish that day because I still wasn't really that great at what I was doing. That's okay. At that point, the McGalloway I had done a rod to, which was a, just a tribute to my trip in that video, which was an 8.6 rod with red wraps and cork, and it was okay. Got a call from the museum out there one time. We'd like to feature you out here. And it was just this, these- We're great, talking about aquatic sporting angle. Totally. Yeah. And having some great conversations with Western Maine, which is where I really learned of the history and really how rich that history was. I said- that McGalloway doesn't match the stories that I'm reading. It doesn't match what Western Maine means to people. And so I decided to reinvent this rod. And one of my first things was, first of all, there's no cork. Let's go back to the 1800s. Where are they getting cork from? There's no cork. No. We're putting wood or twine yeah. on a grip. I'm going to bring back a wood, wood grip. Everybody said, don't do a wood grip. No one wants a wood grip. The hell they don't. I don't care. I took some pine at the time and threw it on my lathe and, and shaped a half well. Found some other wood, did it in birch, did it in uh, maple, find some burl. Wow, that's sexy. Uh, let me see how that feels in my hand. Ooh, that's pretty nice. Learned in short time that that with that finish, that 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 grip, which is really the, one of the signature pieces of that rod, you know, almost like a bat in the 70s with the pine tar, with the grip, that natural oil of your hand, that wood actually feels better than any cork you'll ever have long term. Found the matching reel seat, did some engraved hardware on that, and then discovered Tiger Thread for the first time. And Tiger Thread's available in the mass markets. Tiger Thread, it gives you the ability to kind of put some wraps and have a little texture. The shades that we chose actually pulled out some of the, the golden uh, tones of the burl. And then I said, well, what's sexier than burl on burl with Tiger? Haggett stones. You know, stones back in the day were used only on the very tip top of bamboo when you'd have a seven foot bamboo with four guides, but a swivel top with a little agate stone in the middle. Yeah. So agates are not really uh, a foundational guide, but they evolved far before many of the other parts of the rod. It's hit. a part of jewelry. It's a piece of jewelry on your fly rod. Totally. And but it's also functional. Your your line isn't getting worn down going through agate because it's stone. Totally. Yeah, it's people are using them. It's ceramic, but on a higher level. It was the first bling that people used on rods. Can you think of a commercial fly rod company? I'm thinking graphite and even fiberglass. I mean, commercial. That's make right? No one's doing it. You're doing it, right? Yeah. Let's go back to the tiger. Uh, yeah. What do we call it? Tiger? That tiger thread. Um, it, railroad tracks. Isn't there a story there? No, no there, not no. as much as me looking at Western Maine. What does that mean? What were they fishing? What did those rods look like in the 1800s? Where were we at? The McGalloway is only available at an 865 weight, not because that's what they use. It's my version of a tribute to some, some early day pieces to that rod with some modern day techniques. But you look at it with all of its wood and its tones and your wrap almost looking wood. It really gives you that, that rustic uh, early day feel, but again, with oh, a it's classy, modern Jeff. twist. It's classy. And it's become our national eye candy ever since. It is. It's absolutely. Go ahead on the website. If you're, if you're listening to this, get on, get on Jeff's uh, main fly company website and look at the McGalloway rod and try to convince yourself that that's not a piece <laughs> of artwork. That's a piece of craftsmanship. It's, it's, I, I get some of my guide buddies, you know, that that's their exclusive rod to fish. Um, it's a good fishing rod. It's a great fishing rod. Yeah. And at under 500 bucks, um, 
you know, I'd, I'd, I'd put that up against many, which is my story with most of our rods. Yeah. But every rod's got a similar story or tribute or heartfelt moment that goes with it. You know, it's easy to create the XF-52 nine-foot four-weight. All of ours are named after a waterway. We've got 5,000 to choose from. They're inspired by that, but they're certainly not for those rivers. Um, they're to be fished globally. No, it's just a name. It's just a name yeah. that's, that's from our foundation and from our home as the name Maine Fly Cup. But if you have the opportunity to come down and visit Jeff and his team, um, and we'll, I want to talk a little bit about your team. Yeah. Sure. Um, and, and, and experience the company and experience the shop and the mill and where we are here on the Royal River. I mean, Jeff's shop, uh, I don't know if we've come out and said it on the podcast, it's literally casting a shadow on the Royal River. I mean, and it's not just slow moving water, it's beautiful habitat for what could potentially be great trout fishing. Um, and so, it's, and you see people fishing it. I've come here a couple of times and seen guys and waders out there. The other thing I like too, Jeff, is I noticed that if someone, I was in here one day uh, recently and you had a young guy come in and he said, hey, I called about uh, wanting to try out the uh, Carabasset. <laughs> so you you can come down and cast a fly rod. That's my point. I mean, that's part of us being here. You know, not only do you have the opportunity to walk in the shop and design your own rod or watch rods get made or watch the beautiful river go by outside. But the first batch of rods you walk by when you walk in the shop are all demos. And I leave them there with the intention that I want people to come in, grab one of these rods, take it down on our stretch of the river, which is one of the only that's open all year long. Go try it. Sure. Go literally take any rod we've got with your reel, with one of ours. I don't care how you're reeling it up. Go try this thing on the river and go play with it for the day. You went to one of the big shows this winter. Yeah. You had some success. Oh, yeah. I mean, in terms of people being really impressed. So let's talk from the technical standpoint. Mm. People like your rods, Jeff. Not right. just how they look, but how they cast. Yeah, we're getting better. Um, you know, we're getting better all the time. Um, you know, when this first started, uh, if you were a factory and, and you were willing to send me, sell me five, ten blanks at a time, I'd buy them because nobody wanted anything to do with me. I was another guy trying to be a fly rod company. We were nobody was taking us serious in 2018. You know, fast forward. You know, now our, our, our quantities are certainly higher. My RFP count and factories we can use have expanded tremendously. Request and, for proposal. Thank you. And so you're essentially putting this out and saying, look, I've got a new idea. I want my butt no bigger than this. I want my tip no smaller than this. I want my action somewhere around this. What do you got for mandrels, for lengths, weights, all that stuff. So you try to nail that part down. Then you get into the aesthetics. You pull out the color wheel, you pull out your Pantone book, 7,000 pages of colors, what is this one? What does it speak to? And then you start designing and then you get some samples in and you try them and it, you're always a year ahead of yourself. That yeah, must be fun stuff. It, it, it's getting better by the year. The new rod coming out for us this year, uh, the Fish River, uh, will be the first premium uh, freshwater rod we've done to date. But it's really a reflection of my experience to date. Mm -hmm. uh, while the Fish River is certainly a, a river we want to spend some quality time on, it's it's more of a statement of our evolution of knowledge around carbon compositions and, you know, we're not rolling these blanks in shop. It's how we keep these prices where we, we keep them. But what we are doing is certainly finding the right carbons, knowing what compositions we're after, what we actions, what what we want these things to behave like. And so as we evolve, you know, uh, as a six-year-old company, I, I, I put half of our arsenal against anybody. Oh, yeah. A anybody I, national. I would, too. Now, um, let's talk about cane because you have a, mm. a nice selection of cane rods. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, what are the lengths you offer? What's the weights you offer? What do, what do we have going there? So it's a seven foot four weight and a seven six five weight. Uh, the, Perfect. The cane for me, you know, last year the whole industry went fast and everybody was going fast and calling for fast. And I don't know if I was bucking. I don't know what I did. I said, well, what's the slowest thing imaginable uh, for rods? Well, it's either glass or cane. I thought cane was it. And then I had some, uh, for, for me, I had some connection to the St. John. The St. John brought me back to my French Canadian roots and my uncle, who's also a major influence in Maine Fly Company, who was the true craftsman in our roots. And so the more I thought about bamboo and really to me what a cane finish should really look like that brought me to the craftsman side uh, of me and my roots and my family and the saint john and its tributaries and where it or originates from 
was the perfect caveat for our cane rod. And then we just decided to dress it up to be, you know, probably one of the sexier cane rods you've seen in its flame finish, its agate guides, uh, its uh, its down-facing nickel silver seat, which is non-traditional um, in, its, in its Fenwick grip. Uh, but we do cane now at half the price you'd find them on mass market. Tonkin cane, it's the exact cane you're looking for, uh, but it performs, it's earthy, um, I enjoy it. And basically, as of last year, as I get, you know, trips for myself, or if I'm not out combat fishing with my young staff, uh, and I'm just out enjoying a day on the river, to me, um, I, I enjoy incorporating that cane rod into my solo afternoons on the water. Will you accept a challenge? Sure. You need to take on a glass rod. Oh, I love, yeah. I, I, they're huge. People oh, yeah. are right into it. Get a tiny little one. A stream fish. So I've got tons of blanks here to build them. I just haven't built a batch yet. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it's it's really hot right now. Oh, sure it's it is. It's really hot right now. Yeah. I just did a uh, flashback on um, on the resurrection of fiberglass Glass. rods. It's a vital market that's growing right now. It is. And I think it's really cool because you get these guys that have gone through, they've run the gamut. They've got learned how to fly fish, caught fish, caught more fish, caught big fish, caught trophy fish. Now they want to just catch these tiny little brook trout. Yeah. In this little stream, quietly away from everybody else, they're going to walk six, eight, ten miles. They might not catch anything, but they want to do it with a little buggy whip. Totally. You know what I mean? And feel like you're fighting a, a shark with it. I, I get it. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've got two or three cane prototypes um, or uh, glass prototypes that, that we've made. Uh, they just haven't made it to market yet. I mean, every year I expire a batch or two and I bring on a batch or two. And, and really these first five, six years has been like really creating that really balanced arsenal. When you're shopping our rods, it's very untraditional because the QR52 or whatever anybody else calls their, their line right. usually is available in two weight to nine weight. You can get any option you want and, th and that's design. That's not who and what we are. Um, at best, I have certain rods that have three line weight options. That's it. Uh, if you look at the site carefully, you'll see I've got everything covered from a two weight up to a 10 weight and all actions. But every year has been about really making sure that arsenal is really balanced. And so the cane is, uh, the, uh, the glass is soon to fit, uh, in that, uh, in, over the next couple of seasons. It's, it's a unique market. It's a, it, and it's an un, it's an unserved market, especially, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll leave your competition out of it. Let's just talk about what you could do something with that. Right? Totally. So back to your point, um, you don't have rods in all the sizes. And I had in my head, I wanted to have a rod made for Sherry. I wanted an eight foot six, six weight. Yeah. Uh, because Sherry's not a tall person and she likes to keep that line closer to her. It just works for her. Sure. We needed to have a fighting butt on it because she's small. So Whenever she catches a nice four pound small mouth, she puts that butt right up in right <laughs> sure up against her, her rib cage. Yeah. Cause that's the easiest way for her to reel that in. Yeah. And um I don't want a, a hook keeper on it because those always get pushed down flat by my dog in the drift boat. Do you know what I mean, Jeff? <laughs> I do, I do. So I garland and garland goes, Yes, yes. Garland is one of his craftsmen we're talking about. Yeah. And I'm I'm visiting with him, talking about this rod for Christmas. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we'll have it done in a week and a half. That's right. And it was done in less than that. That's right. So that's who you guys are. That's right. Right. And it's just, it's terrific. I want to modify that fish stick to be your way. Yeah. Uh, we even have people that call us and say, look, I, I love that Kennebec rod you have. Uh, can you do it with a half well? Can you put my name on it? And can you yeah. add a butt? Sure. We're happy to do that for you. Um you know, the idea is, again, when you're walking out or we're shipping or you're somewhere across the country, I want you to have that unique fish stick that you're really going to love to have. Um, it's everything we're about. And that service part, um, you know, as long as we're capable of doing it, we're always happy to do it. Well, let's talk about the service part because I was impressed. You know, the question, the, <clears throat> the unanswered questions I had when I walked in the door were answered very smoothly. So I break, Cherry and I break her carabasset on our third trip this summer because the dog steps on the second section mm. and breaks it. Mm. I come down, I walk through your door. What happens next? 50 bucks later or 60 bucks? What, yeah. yeah. What is it? Yeah. $69. Yeah. Usually plus shipping. Yeah. Um, it is where we've been to date. We'll rebuild it for it. The nice thing about most, and I, and I mean this, I mean like 99% of our clients, our customers, uh, I broke it. I stepped on it. I slammed in the screen door, the dog ate it, whatever. It's usually, 
you know, just an error in, in daily function. I appreciate that. When it's not something that's defective or something that just accidentally occurred, we actually jump that ahead of line on most of our other rods. First thing I'll usually ask you if it's me, is this your only rod? Yeah. Oh, listen, go grab a demo in the front. Take that with you so you've got something to fish with for the next week. And we'll replace this section for you for 69 bucks. I'll see you in a week. That's what all the companies are doing now. There's a lot of market research that rods don't fail. If they're going to fail, they're going to fail on day one. Always. And so always. it's almost always an example of a cone head coming by uh, or a dumbbell eye on a, on a saltwater rod on a clouser, hitting, intersecting with a rod, nicking it, taking and basically jeopardizing its hoop integrity. And now all of a sudden, a cast or two later, the thing breaks. Or leaning it against the car, it slides down. Just that friction enough is enough to remove that outer coating. Rods break. They don't fail. To a large extent, some rods can fail, but you're agreeing with me, correct? Yes. So I've noticed, and I like this, well, a, a rod company will go unnamed. I broke a section of rod and I contacted them and that popped right up. Rods don't fail. They get broken. Mm -hmm. We have a special program. We will replace that section of your rod. Just tell us what model size you have and send us a check, which I was glad to do. Yeah. So $50 or $75 is, is short change for a solution that comes like that, Jeff. Completely. So if I sent, and I've sent many Sage rods back to Sage. Six months later. Yeah. And sometimes a hundred dollars. Yeah. Depending on what you're dealing with. Whereas with with I don't know what it is with you, but I bet you're gonna get that section back in a couple of weeks. Listen, if you've come in and I've already got one on a rod that's sitting on a shelf that's unpurchased, I'd I'll grab a second section off a rod and give it to you the same day if I can. That's right. You know, the goal is to get you back on the water. And you're a hundred percent correct. And there's massive misconceptions of this on the market. When a rod is defective, well, first of all, a lifetime warranty on a rod is a marketing scheme. When a millimeter wall of a carbon fiber or graphite rod is compromised, you're going to know it the first fish you catch up on, the first time you get snagged and rip on that rod, that rod's done. Yep. Anything after that, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's usually self-inflicted. Always. Uh, unless your cork comes loose, your seat is loose, or a guide falls off. That's craftsmanship. That's a warranty issue. Rods break. It doesn't make you a bad, good, different angler. It, it, it's just a part of fly fishing. My job at that point is to, you know, hear what would have happened. Uh, if you're telling me this thing really just snapped on the first one, but your cork is brown and and looks like you fished a hundred times. Look, I may not agree with you necessarily, but I'll probably end up honoring it nonetheless. But it's really obvious when a rod's new and it broke on the first, or if it's been around for a year and, you know, we've got that data. Long story short, I want to get you back out there. I, I, I trust in people's integrity. I hope you trust in ours. Um, but I just want to get that rod full for you and get you back out there. Let's talk about integrity because I know you talk about it. We've talked about it before, but you also talk about it on your website and what your core values and principles and guiding principles are, Jeff, about what you're training your your team, how, how to come across to the customer. Yeah. Um, first off, there's integrity. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Look. <laughs> I, you know, maybe it's my, my, my years as a consultant, but I'm not sure what it is. I find so many businesses are led by, by dollars and cents revenue. There's got to be some sort of core principles that you make decisions on every day. I've had core values from before day one. And anytime there's a difficult decision for us to make, it could be staffing, it could be a warranty, it could be a contractual conversation, you always reflect back to your core values. Does this decision I'm going to make align with these values? Um, if not, then you're not making the right decision. To me, it's that, it's that back to center. I have them posted on our wall. When you walk in the shop, it's one of the first things you see. And then I have a second duplicate exact version of that sign that sits next to my, on my wall next to my desk as a constant reminder to steer back to those values and make sure your decisions align with those values. I think it's something that's missing in small business, large business, medium business. And I think when you, when you're doing something you really love and there's a great passion to it, you know, it's easy in the heat of the moment to make bad choices, good choices. We all make them and sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. To me, as long as they align with our values, they're a good choice for us. And, um, you know, we hope that resonates out to our, our customers. It does well. 
in my own work, Jeff, I can tell you that I, I carry that same um, ethos and that I've found when there's a mistake or a problem, if you look at it as an opportunity and not a problem or a mistake and you own it and you make it right, you have a customer forever because people really hang their hat on the way that you treat them. And I think you guys have set yourselves up really well here. Uh, Jeff, where do you see the company in five years? <laughs> or maybe you can. I, I, you know, you I, got an idea? Yeah, I've got a pretty good roadmap. I mean, the, 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 you know, I'm always reluctant to share the roadmap only because I never want to be assumed that our trajectory and growth is going to continue. I'm humble. I'm, I'm grateful every day that I get to walk into this shop and call this work. Um, and we're grinders. I'm a grinder. We face nothing but adversity for 50% of the year as a small business and an industry uh, that's, that's strong. Um, but based on where I hope that we're going to continue to be, you know, we're, we're exactly the same. We're still answering the phones. You're not going through automated, you know, prompts to only end up leaving the voicemail. We want to make sure there's some personality in the shop that's going to greet you and treat you the same no matter where we end up. Will we be here? That part's in question. Um, I have some grand plans of, you know, our own pond and filled with trout and a greater experience even than you're gaining with us. But as we grow, it's not about getting leaner and increasing profits. It's about expanding and creating more opportunities so more people get to live this lifestyle that we pinch ourselves every day, grateful that we get to live. And we're only looking to expand on the experiences that our customers are having with us. We want to grow that part of it. I don't think, I think we live in a different time, Jeff. Uh, I think that there used to be a time where you needed to be on Main Street in Freeport to pick up foot traffic. Yeah. Your customer is not that customer. No. Your customer is going to look you up on Google Maps, which is what I did, and I'm going to find the mill. I'm going to plug it in. And I'm going to go out of my way to come check it out. And I encourage our audience to do the same because it's a great experience, Jeff. And you've created something here. Let's talk about your team. Mm. I love them. It's a small team. We're a small business. Um, but I don't look at necessarily the team only as, you know, who receives a paycheck on payday. The team to me is 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 such a broad audience. I mean, I've got guides and friends that have been with me since day one. I consider them team. Uh, we've got new retailers that are selling our stuff in on their main tree USA, very successful outdoor business. I look at them as part of my team. The people who take photos for us, that's part of my team. I'm not naive. None of this could have happened on just my sole ambition in, in grit. This is a combination of uh, so many people contributing in so many different ways. But as I choose those alignments and those people and, and welcome them into this culture that we've created here, those people align with our core values. Those are people that aren't social shaming and, and, and doing all the things that, to me, we're 100% against. We want this really welcoming you know, opportunity, community. And, and so our team is expansive. My internal team my core team, my builders, if you will, um, are all very skilled people who have come from completely other industries with, with, with uh, you know, with degrees in very different industries who basically had very similar stories to mine, right? I got out, I followed this trajectory I was supposed to be on. I ended up with this big company. It's not what I want. I'd rather be here in my flip-flops, washing the river, listening to music, talking about fly rods and being creative all day. And I think the thing that tr translates is when you come in and you meet one of the members of your team or you, Jeff, and you're talking to the person about the fly rod, and this is also the person that builds the fly rod. <laughs> yeah. Right? Where are you going to find that? That's important. It's Well, it's, again, it's part of the whole cottage uh, industry part of, of what you bring, which is unique. Um, I think not only is the brand name cool, uh, the rods are effective. They're beautiful. They're art. Um, you have the right attitude. You have a formula for success. I wish you the best. Thank you. And it means everything that you took this part of your life and time to, to share it with me. Thank you. And our audience. And, and thanks for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. 
And that brings us to the end of this episode. Flyline Podcast has completed the second season with these wonderful 12 episodes. We loved every minute we spent sharing stories from and with our guests. We will be taking a short break as we and our main legends and luminaries are enjoying the best part of the main fishing season and feel more obligated to spend time in the outdoors than in front of a microphone discussing it. Great news for our podcast fans and followers. We already have many great guests and episodes lined up for the third season. Please go to flylinepodcast.com and subscribe to receive notifications when season three is ready to resume. Until then, go catch a fish. <laughs>